right, welcome to CS4510. This is lecture 05A. This is the fifth class. Uh, first half today is really interesting. To me personally, it's a bit of a uh, divergence. It's on what's called uh, syntactic uh, structures. And what is syntactic structures? Really, it's this book by Chomsky. So there's this book. Um, I found a copy of it on eBay. Sometimes I get tired of reading the PDF, so I just look at the, uh, I go and I hunt down a copy. The only, the cheapest copy I could find, though, was like from 1962. Um, this is a phenomenal piece of uh, science, and uh, it's really an application of the theory that we've learned so far. So I'm going to present it really only for that reason. Like, it's going to be... So it, it's, it's a basically a study of linguistics. And the point of it isn't the study itself. Like, we don't actually care about linguistics, but we care about an application of the ideas that we've learned so far um, to science. So linguistics was a very empirical field. Like, it was very, you know, you had field workers, you would go into... Uh, you would travel over the world, and you record people's sentences and structure, and you would try and say something about it. Um, uh, what Chomsky does really, and the reason this is so significant, is he brings like a computer science perspective into a very empirical field. He goes into someone else's house with more math than them. What's up? Uh, with more math than them, and he um, Instead of doing something very empirical, he starts from a very foundational uh, kind of thing, and he solves a lot of problems. He can say, he can say uh, lots of things. So just to review quickly, today we're talking about a whole book on syntactic structures by Noam Chomsky. Um, it, we don't care about the book itself as much as we care about uh, the content in the book. So um, we're just going to go, there's 10 chapters, we're just going to cover all 10 chapters today, and at the end we'll talk about one problem that uh, Chopsky uh, solved. So, um, chapter one, the introduction. So what is linguistics? And by the way, in the actual book, I, I highly recommend you read the book, if you can, the PDF. It's like 100 pages, it's not really a book, it's a monograph. If you just format something like a book and you call it a book, people call it a book, but I could show you in the camera, that's chapter one. And then it ends. So that's like all of chapter one. And then you're on chapter two. Um, so I'm going to kind of pad this a little bit. So what is linguistics? Linguistics is like the study of language. But what is uh, language? So language is like you have, um, I don't know, a guy, me, and then... You know, you have some, a listener, like this is you, you guys are in the class, and you guys are bored, and uh, let's say I say to you uh, the word, like, horse, right? I speak, I say the word horse, I use my vocal cords to um, produce syllables in some order, and then I, the, the sound that comes out of my mouth is a horse, and, but horse, when you, when you hear me say horse, maybe you thought, a horse, you probably imagine, I don't know, some kind of quadruped. I, I don't know. Like some kind, of, some kind of animal. It eats grass. It's got four legs. You know, either. Um, this is what linguistics is. This is what communication is. The, from an information theory perspective, the language is a lossy channel. The idea of the horse is vastly more complicated than the horse, the word horse itself. Horse, just sounds I make with my mouth. Horse, but the idea of a horse is much different than the idea, than the word horse. So language is really an agreement we all have. Uh, um, it, as to what sounds correspond to what ideas. And somehow we're able to learn this from language itself, even though the ideas are vastly more complicated than the sounds uh, that they make. So we are really, you know, uh, there, there, are, there aren't enough words to convey the ideas that we think uh, themselves. And it's pretty well accepted that we are trapped within 
the limits of our own language uh, to express the human condition. You know, we can't really say everything we want. I mean, like if I said horse, maybe you imagined a different horse than I did. Maybe you imagined, I was thinking of the movie Spirit. I don't know if you, what kind of horse you maybe you've thought of, but you know, there's, people think of different things, right? So maybe I would have to say the movie Spirit to convey, a, a, the more words you use, of course, the better you are at conveying a certain idea. Like right now I've said one, I've used like a thousand words already on talking about this one topic about, uh, you know, meta uh, of, uh, of itself. So. A theory of linguistics, uh, I'll say a scientific uh, theory of linguistics uh, should uh, distinguish the grammatical Uh, from the ungrammatical. Also, today might be the closest you've had to an English lecture in like a really long time. I'm going to use the word noun and verb, uh, but I won't get too deep into some of the things I promised. Um, so, a scientist. So, like, uh, what is a? We uh, understand what a grammatical sentence is, even if we it hard, it's hard to define what a sentence if a sentence is grammatical or ungrammatical. Like, I give you a sentence. I say, tell me if this is gr grammatical or not. You can somehow do it, even if you maybe not cannot explain to someone else what makes a sentence grammatical or ungrammatical. It requires being part of the, the pact. You have to, in order to speak a language, you have to participate in the agreement of what certain words mean. You know, like if I disagree with you what horse means, who cares? But if millions of people disagree with you on what horse means, then suddenly the definitions change, right? So new words are added all the time. It's not like the people who write the dictionary are not like, Lawmakers, they're just recorders. They see what people are saying, and then they, that's, that's how the agreement uh, works. But how would you create like a scientific definition of what grammatical or ungrammatical means? And this is actually kind of hard. Um, the best way I can explain this is with this analogy. Have you heard of the story of Diogenes and Plato? It's kind of a one of them. Do you remember what the story was? Okay, so the, basically what happens is Plato says to his audience, Diogenes, by the way, was a homeless man. He was a serial public masturbator. He lived right. in a jar, okay? He was, uh, he famous quotes about being uh, the school of cynicism, you know, the, no place to spit in, in a rich man's house except house. his face. You know, um, what else? The, uh, the master needs the slave, but the slave doesn't need the master. Something like this, real like the opposite of a niche like nihilism kind of guy, um, ex pretty eccentric. Uh, ancient Greece, Plato, you know, famous professor, whatever, philosopher, had the school. People came and listened to what he said, Platonic solids, uh, Platonism, whatever, right? Big, get big guy. He announces that he has some, he has a definition of a man. Uh, ancient Greek philosophy, by the way, pretty basic stuff. It's just coming up with the essentials uh, of everything. So he says that everything, so he, uh, Plato asserts that a man, uh, is equal to a featherless biped. So in or if we really think of it, so Plato asserts that a man is a featherless biped. That's his assertion. And what basically what he says is like, like if you do a, uh, if you do like a flow chart, uh, it's got no feathers and it's a biped. This is a man. By man, we mean like humanity, like a human being. What distinguishes man from animal? Uh, I don't know what kind of animals were running around ancient Greece, but to Plato, uh, a platonic man is a featherless biped. And so these would be like... Right, so anything that is, has feathers or is not a biped is not a man. Um, and famously, Diogenes crashes the scene busts into the room, whatever. Maybe this is hyperbolic, but he, he holds up he holds up a plucked chicken and says, behold, a man. So it's this idea that, like, you know, um, a plucked chicken is a biped, because a chicken is a biped, and a plucked chicken has no feathers. 
So this is really, uh, Diogenes really, what he does here is he presents a counterexample to Plato's definition of what a man is. So, and um, it's embarrassing for Plato, whatever. It's mostly tongue-in-cheek uh, of a story. And then Plato updates his definition to say, uh, you know, a man is that which is featherless, a biped, and has fingernails. That's his new definition. But I think for any uh, definition Plato could give, we could always give some sort of counterexample, like a plucked chicken. Maybe I glue fingernails onto the chicken, right? I don't know. It might be a good exercise to think what is not a man to us intuitively, but is featherless, a biped, and has fingernails. Maybe a monkey. No, a monkey's four. Anyway, you get what I'm saying, right? You can come up with a counterexample. So the problem here really, with Plato's idea, is that he's trying to come up with the definition of a man, which is characterizable as something that's checkable, like, easily, like, outside the system. So, like, he has a definition of a man through some equivalences that are things that he thinks are satisfiable to be a man. But the best definition of what a man is, to Plato, is going to be... Uh, uh, to Plato, man is what? Plato says is a man. So we can only arrive here at a kind of a circular definition. So to Plato, a man is whatever Plato says is a man. So Plato, obviously you know what a man is. You look at a thing, you say that's a man. Or that's not a man. Obviously, that is the thing. That's a, it, somehow you are like this. This is you, or something, right? Somehow inside you, somehow is the definition. And internally, you can act as a ding distinguisher for a man, even if you cannot express uh, a way to get the definition out of you. So you know what a man is. You can obviously act as a distinguisher. You can say that's a man. That's not a man. Good. But then you can't, but I claim that this is the only definition that is satisfiable for Plato's definition of a man. You can't take this definition and characterize it by a sequence of things that, are, that don't require a person, right? This is an example. So man is one of these abstract concepts which is not easily checkable outside of the thing. Everyone knows what a man is and isn't. You know, a chimpanzee is not a man. A featherless biped is not a man. But you are a man and you are a man and... So on, right? So um, that's an that's an example of a distinguishing between you know man and animal or, or something. Similarly, I claim grammatical is the same. So like grammatical is something that's hard to characterize. When exactly is a sentence grammatical? When is exactly is a sentence ungrammatical? You can read a sentence and say it's grammatical or ungrammatical, but you can't really like explain to someone uh, what makes a sentence grammatical or ungrammatical without teaching them the entire language. Yes? Just to confirm, in the decision tree, yes and no both point to not man. Yes. Right. So if it has feathers, right. yes, it's not a man, according to Plato. Right. This is Plato's flowchart. Okay? Right. If it has feathers, but stands on four, if, it, if it's featherless, but is not a biped, then it's also not a man. So like I'm guessing like a sheep, whatever ancient Grecian animals were there. You know, of all the things you could see, that were man and not man, this was his, his characterization. You know, of all the objects that the Greeks had to look at, there was rocks, there was sheep, there was people, basically it, right? So it's, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's, uh, it seems to work for his few, you know, any scientific theory, you have uh, a finite amount of observations, and then you have to somehow be able to explain those observations. And that's, that, that might have worked for Plato, because no, he had never seen a plucked chicken, right? So... Um, right, so that's, that's uh, linguistics as a theory, it, it has the same difficulty here because you have to explain something. You're trying to explain something. What is a grammatical sentence? What is an ungrammatical sentence? But you can't really do it without just saying, obviously, there's some intuitive definition. Obviously, that sentence is grammatical. We're gonna, I'm going to write sentences today, and we're going to be like, oh, yeah, that one's obviously grammatical. And then we'll write another sentence, and it's be like, obviously, that one's ungrammatical. We don't know why to explain why it's ungrammatical or grammatical. Because we participate in the agreement of language, we know somehow we have this internalized definition. This is also the reason why CAPTCHA 
does what it does. Okay, it's hard. You know, everyone knows what a stop sign is. It's hard to explain what the stop stop. How do you explain to a stop sign to someone? Perfectly, like in a machine characterization. Like uh, this is a machine, right? You could implement this as a program. You, how would you implement a program to do detect stop sign? You say just look for any octagon that's. But then, if, what if the octagon is a different angle? That's why CAPTCHA does what it does. It basically extracts the definition from you through a million samples, right? You internally know what the what the what a stop sign looks like from all angles and positions. And then you, through the sequence of examples, you explain it to the machine. So the CAPTCHA extracts the definition from you through a million examples. It's not perfect. It'll never be perfect characterization. But it basically builds, like, what is machine learning except a billion if statements, right? So it's like, that's all it really does yeah. uh, as a generalized sense. Um, right, so that was basically chapter one. Uh, we're going to talk about chapter two now. Um, it's called the independence. Independence of grammar. So uh, consider this sentence. Uh, actually, before I, I, I get into this, I should talk about what syntax is. So syntax is about uh, structure <coughs> and uh, representation. Uh, semantics is about meaning. So structure is about, so syntax is about a structure. I mean, maybe you have understanding of syntax of a programming language or something. Syntax is about the descriptions themselves. Semantics is about meaning. So semantics uh, is about what something means. Syntax is about what something says. And sometimes I say something, I say words at you, and those words are in an order. But the sentence I speak conveys meaning itself that you understand independent of the uh, structure of the, of the sentence. So it was thought for a while, like, maybe there's some strong relationship between this. Like, maybe the study of language, because because we only have the ability to express our ideas through limited language, we can only convey things through language. Maybe the only way... Maybe the, only, the study of language itself is a study of ideas. Like maybe we can only explain semantical things by studying the way we can express them. Like that's like an old world view. And Chomsky basically says that syntax and semantics with respect to grammar are like totally independent. And he does this kind of, again, we can't really talk too much about science. We can't like prove things. But the best we can do is kind of prove things. We can kind of give counterexamples and things. That's kind of what he does throughout the book on, on this. So he gives the sentence, uh, colorless uh, green ideas uh, sleep uh, furiously. So is this sentence grammatical or ungrammatical? Probably grammatical. It's grammatical. Why? Because there's a verb and an object and a noun. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Is the best answer because there's somehow we all agree this sentence is grammatical. We don't know why it's grammatical, but we know it's a grammatical. So grammatical, it, yes, it has correct syntax somehow in an unexplainable way. Um, what about the semantic value of the sentence? There's none. Exactly, it's devoid of meaning. There's no mean. Ironically, this is a very famous sentence, and because he uses this as an example, there's a whole Wikipedia page just for this one sentence, and there's a contest to see how you can use this sentence. So because he chose this as an example of a sentence without meaning, it now has meaning, ironically. So this is actually um, an example. This is a counterexample. So just because something is grammatical does not mean it has semantic value. This is, certainly there are many things without semantic value that are, excuse me, many things that have no syntactic or semantic value. There's plenty of gibberish out there. But this is something that is correctly grammatical. Somehow we all agree by the intonation of the words, somehow the order of the words makes it say, you know, the way it's like, like the, I don't know, pentameter or whatever. Somehow you know the words sound like they go together, even if they don't mean anything. So some, this is, a, we'll talk about the difference, we'll talk about separating uh, syntax and semantics a little bit later as well, but this is kind of the starting idea about why these two ideas are different. And this is his counterexample about why these two ideas are different, for syntax and semantics. Um, and then we can, 
then he comes up with the second sentence, uh, which is furiously uh, sleep ideas green uh, colorless. So is this sentence grammatical or ungrammatical? This is, so this one was grammatical, and this one was ungrammatical. We agree on that. So by reversing the word order, uh, this is the same sentence, but we've simply reversed the order of the words. Um, he says, he makes this incredibly generalizing uh, idea. And that, basically he says, like, um, um, let me make sure I have it exactly down. So he says, the fact that the first one is grammatical and the second one is ungrammatical, he uses it to assert this uh, position. Grammatical in English has no relationship, is entirely independent of statistical approximation to English. So that's his assertion. He says that the first is grammatical, the second is ungrammatical, yet both are equally likely to appear in English. Like if you t consider that all the sentences spoken and sort them by frequency, both of these are going to be at the bottom of the list. However, one is grammatical and the other isn't. So he says any model of grammar should, cannot be probabilistic. This is a controversial, today at least, controversial view. And it has not held up as well, but I have to present this. Um, like, he had, uh, so Chomsky, Chomsky, by the way, is ancient. He's like 91 now. Uh, he's 91. Yeah, he's still alive. Chomsky is very much still alive. He had an op-ed in the New York Times in March, and he had this thing called, it was called the false promise of ChatGPT. You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? The, yeah. yeah. So basically, uh, Chat GP, he argues ChatGPT is wrong, and it's saying kind of BS, and I kind of agree with him. But no one is debating the fact that ChatGPT produces valid grammatical sentences, OK? This ChatGPT may be unable, I'm a hater of it. It may be unable to infer meaning correctly, but no one has argued it produces gibberish. No one has argued it's going to say something incorrect. I think, personally, it's like cheating. Like, if you have a, some kind of model of grammar, and the model takes billions of terabytes, and we only measure its correctness on sentences much, much shorter than the size of the model. Like, an algorithm, you measure the runtime of the algorithm on inputs much larger than the algorithm. When we measure the ChatGPT, I don't know how many terabytes it is, whatever, billions of terabytes. It takes one cent of electricity per query, right? That's a lot of power. Somehow it's the supercomputer thing, and it, we, but we only look at small samples of its instances relative to the size of the problem. That's, that's my opinion. But this is an ancient, like this goes contrary, contrary to the machine learning theorists' view for a long time because the probabilistic models, like PAC learning, uh, he kind of like waves it away. But this was like 1957. Uh, I don't think the electric computer was even invented then. I think they were still using punch cards and tubes and whatever, right? This is, so he's kind of arguing like any kind of probabilistic model should not be able to correctly d d do grammar. It's 75 years old, that, this argument. So it hasn't held up as well. The success that ChatGPT produces, even before ChatGPT, I mean, there was chatbots and things, right? So grammar has been kind of solved way before, even if the, it can't produce semantical value sentences, and no one argues. You can even tell ChatGPT, like, but say it like a cowboy or something, right? It'll, it'll do the accents. It'll do all that for you. <laughs> but this is his kind of, this is a, not, we're not even concerned necessarily with the linguistics itself. We're, we're concerned with the kind of formal arguments you can make about an unscientific theory. Linguistics is not science. It's, uh, it's, it's something else. But, you know, you can kind of bring a scientific inquiry method into the field with counterexamples like this to argue kind of rigorously about something which, a field which may be unrigorous. Like, this is the best you can do, basically. You will never be able to prove this, but it, you can give evidence in favor of, certainly. That's, the, that's really the moral of uh, uh, this today. So that's what he says. Um, 
like grammar is independence. There's an independence of syntax and semantics, and that he argues kind of loosely that a probabilistic model should not be able to generate uh, correct uh, English. So chapter three and elementary linguistic theory. We're going to do all 10 chapters, but skip over the parts that are too hard that I don't care about. I'm trying to summarize like an entire book. Yes? You probably already talked about this, but is this going to be on the test? Is no. Oh. This part is kind of just an application. There's not, I don't think there's any questions I could ask about this, to be honest. Right. So, yeah. Okay, so basically, um, uh, he kind of uh, notes two facts. First is English. And by the way, we don't care about English itself as a language. I personally think we should rename English and call it American. Um, Why? Don't like the English. They didn't. Oh. Same. Yeah. Can't stand Doing English. something over there. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. Still believe I like in British people. Monarchies. Yeah. yeah. You make, like British they people? They make great reality TV. But you guys probably don't do it. Well, I, I like watching animals in the zoo, too. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's there. like, that's not fair. Okay. <laughs> Fairly human. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, English, he says, uh, oh, we don't care about English itself. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't care about English itself. We care about uh, the language that we speak, and any theory we can develop in English is going to generalize to other languages because they share many common traits, right? Nouns and verbs and so on. And so he notes this, this, this fact. English has some regular uh, substructure. So we call these things DFAs, but he calls them, the much older term, he calls them a finite state Markov process. So he notes the following um, thing. Consider this, this as a state diagram. Oh. So we're considered with syntactic structures itself. We're considered with objects that can define and describe the language. Here is a DFA for a subset of English. And it's not only a subset, but it's a finite subset. So the man comes and the men come are two valid sentences. And that will get you from the start state to the accept state easily. Um, but this is a finite part. There do exist DFAs that can enumerate infinite grammatical sentences. Uh, you can do this, old. So you can say the old man comes, the old, old man comes, the old, old, old man comes. And that might be rude, but that is grammatical. It's a hyperbole, uh, certainly. And so no one would argue that this is ungrammatical, right? Certainly. You have questions you have? You said uh, gram grammatical in English has no relationship with statistical approximation. But doesn't a Markov process like inherently contain probability? Ah, DFA is Markov process with probabilities one. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. So um, by this, he means like the more like frequency. Like both of these sentences have negligible probability of being ever uttered. Right. They have equal negligible probability. So the probability is not, you can't ever say never. You can always yeah. only say almost never because you can't enumerate every possible instance, whatever. But however, one is grammatical and the other isn't. So these should right. have, if there were somehow a function of probability of occurrence, both of these should be either both grammatical or ungrammatical. However, one is grammatical and the other is not. Right. That's his distinguishing idea here. I see. Yeah. So this is a kind of a regular substructure for an infinite subset of English. Uh, this, so you might conjecture maybe English itself is regular. Uh, but he actually proves uh, no. English has non-regular substructure. 
So he gives some subset of English that looks regular, and then he argues that English actually has no non-regular uh, substructure. So we argue, you, first he mentions the following two languages, A to the N, B to the N, um, W, W, R, and W, W. Uh, these are the three canonical non-regular languages that we proved via the pumping lemma are not regular. So A to the N, B to the N, even with palindromes and WW. He mentions these three as examples, which are non-regular languages. And then he con constructs um, the following kind of, again, we can't do science, we can't do math here, but we can kind of, if something looks like a math proof, it has a similar amount of convincing as a math proof. So he does, he, he kind of does that here. And that, that's really the point of it, is these kinds of arguments, rather than the, uh, the, the, the theory itself. So he says, let S1, S2, be uh, declarative uh, sentences. You remember what declarative sentences are? I don't. <laughs> you say something, you declare it. Yes. Ends in a period? Ends in a period? That might be it, actually. Mm. Inter interrogative sentences are questions. Declarative sentences, that might just be it. That might be it. But I think, I mean, as obviously a sentence is declarative if you see it. I don't remember the actual definition. Um, he says, consider the following sentence. Um, S is equal to if, I guess all caps, if SI, uh, then uh, SJ. So where SI and SJ are any other declarative sentences. So if I go to the moon, then I eat cheese. Whatever, it doesn't matter. This is certainly, certainly if SI and SJ are declarative, S is declarative. Okay. Um, let... Uh, SI equal S. So he performs a recursion here. And what do you get? You're going to get if, if uh, SI, then uh, SJ, then SJ. So if you notice here, this if you repeat this, you're going to get something that looks kind of like... Uh, Uh, the if has to be there, and the then has to be there. They're dependent on each other. You can't just remove one. If, F, F, if SI, ungrammatical. Nothing. Then SJ, ungrammatical. Yes? The second S something, is that J or I? If SI, then SJ, SJ, yeah. Okay. Then SJ, then SJ, yeah. With repetition, uh, you get uh, something like, If to the n s i, then s j to the n, right? Well, this is kind of like a to the n, b to the n, right? Kind of. There's an n and there's an n there, and they're dependent upon each other. There's an s i in the middle. Yeah. Take it to be epsilon at one point, or who cares? Right. Take it to be one final declarative sentence that isn't recursion. Right, you have some terminating base case. Is Cer a, a to the n, c, b to the n? Yeah, absolutely. That is also context-free, not regular, for the same reason. I see. Right. Great example as well. So this is an example of a subset of English which is not regular. There should not be a DF be similar because in formal language theory, there is no DFA to produce a to the n, b to the n. There should not be a structure of the DFAs uh, to produce this subset of English. Now, this is a weird sentence. If, 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 something, then, 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 then something, then something, then something, whatever. It's a weird sentence, but it is undeniably grammatical. You may have never heard of it or seen it, but it is valid, certainly. Um, there are, he comes up with some other examples, but I really just wanted to do one. He's very rigorous in the things, and I suggest you read the book if you care. Uh, to get into the nitty-gritty examples, but I just wanted to give one example of why English is uh, not regular here. So this is our first application of the theory we've really developed so far, that somehow your brain is full of wires and pipes, okay? There's something going on there. Somehow the wires and pipes are not going to look regular. The association of these wires and pipes won't look like a DFA. If anything, they'll look more like a context-free grammar than they will like a DFA. Doesn't mean they look anything like a context-free grammar, but they won't look like a DFA, certainly. Um, 
So is English finite? So on the homework, I asked you to prove that every finite language is regular, right? So is English finite? Maybe. Like, most sentences have length less than a million. And there's only finitely many sentences that are less than a million. So they come up with new words, like, every day. Sure, but let's say there's, is there's, all those words are still have length less than a million. So this, this is kind of an open-ended question, and the correct answer is it doesn't matter. So he, actually, this DFA we gave, this produces an infinite language, old, 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 arbitrarily long. So maybe some of those sentences get too long to be grammatical, I don't know. But he argues then, like, infinite, it doesn't matter if the infinite, if English is infinite or not, because what is the DFA or the NFA that you have to give on the homework for uh, knowing if a language is... Do, I ask you to prove every finite language is regular. So maybe you use regular expressions, NFAs, or DFAs. Do you guys remember what do you... How, how did you prove that a finite language was regular? I just took, like, the or in the regular expression for all the words in the language. Right. I said that's the regular expression. Easy, clean proof. The idea is, like, to prove that every finite language is regular, you make... Uh, you can either take a finite epsilon transitions of many NFAs, each one accepts one word, something like this. That structure does not, is not sufficient because it's really a cheat. It doesn't really enumerate the finite language in a smart way. What it does is just memorizes. It hard codes the language. So certainly we have the ability to synthesize and analyze English. And um, we can't, uh, but we don't memorize every sentence. We don't, every, Every sentence with high probability is a sentence that has never been spoken before, right? You are somehow synthesizing speech on the fly. You're not memorizing speech beforehand and then interpreting it. Like, you don't say a sentence to me, and then I go look at my lookup table. I mean, that's what, the, that's what that proof really is, is a lookup table of the sentences that, yeah. Never been said before, like, how? Because I'm sure it's been said before. Every time you add a word to a sentence, you decrease the probability that sentence has ever been spoken. What about, like... I drove home. That sentence itself. What about, like, I drove home? Like, I feel like uh, it's been uttered many times. Throughout history? Throughout every time every time, every, everyone has ever spoken? Um, so, like, Google, there's some statistic. Like, 30% of new searches every day are new. Like, they don't have a lookup table. 30% of Google searches have never been Googled before in the billions of history of Google oh, searches. Okay. So, um... This is not maybe the good analogy, but like in chess, there's like, with high probability after like seven moves, it's a position that has never been played before. Mm -hmm. So you can't record and write down things. It's not efficient. Not only is it not efficient, but it's not, the, it's not in the spirit of the problem itself. We somehow are using recursion in our brains to understand and synthesize speech in a way that we're not memorizing and, and things. You, you will encounter new sentences every day. I mean, that's why you go to class. Otherwise, you would have known everything already, right? So. You learn new things all the time. Uh, right. So that's chapter, that's all of chapter three. He just proves that there's some non-regular substructure in English. Um, chapter four, he introduces something called a phase structure. A phrase structure. Also, I'm just going to do on this board because everyone's on this side. So he defines a phrase structure, which initially looks something like what we call as a context-free grammar. So he basically notes that context-free grammars are, seem useful for English. Like, um, he's not the one to think of context-free grammars, like uh, the, the recursive structure of sentences is kind of obvious, right? You have mm, a sentence has a noun and verb. That noun is somehow replaceable by, you know, a non-terminal, and then that can go to any verb or something like this. So he does, for example, uh, here's like a kind of a context-free grammar for a subset of English. He goes like S goes to uh, NP plus VP. Use a slightly different notation here. These are one non-terminal, and concatenation is represented by a plus. It's not exactly what we use for context for grammars. We use one capital letter. This is, for, but it, when you get actually into the programming thing, it's like you don't want to have variables all one letter, right? So this is a, NP is for noun phrase, VP is for verb phrase, and then he does something like uh, 
NP goes to T plus N. Uh, VP goes to a verb plus NP. Uh, T, do you guys remember what the word the is? Oh, this should be. An article. An article, yeah, I never remember that. T is for article, so we'll just put the. And then we'll go N goes to man, ball, men, etc. So N goes to the list of nouns. And then verb is going to go to hit, hits, etc. So verb is going to go to the list of verbs. How come verb isn't just E? Could be just V. Doesn't matter. Let's maybe keep it different so it's not like VP and then P is something or right. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter really. Um, this is kind. This is a context-free grammar. Uh, why is this context-free? The right-hand rules. The left hands of the, all the rules are single non-terminals. Like a sentence cannot contain this N. This N is an object. It's not an actual sentence. The sentence is the words, right? So man, ball, men, hits, 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 the. Right and so on, and the the right hand side is a combination of terminals and non terminals. So this is a context free grammar for some subset of English. And S actually we call it for start, but it, you could say it's for sentence. So we're going to produce a sentence using this grammar. We're going to go S, and it goes to VP, NP plus VP. So we're going to do it like this. We're going to do a tree. We're going to go to NP, and VP, and then NP and VP. NP is going to go to uh, T plus N, so T and N. VP is going to go to verb plus NP. T is going to go to the. N is going to go to nouns. So now we have to actually choose the sentence we're producing. And I'm going to say the man. Verb is going to go to hit. And NP is going to go to... Um, Yes. And T is going to go to the, and I'm going to put ball here. So here we produce the sentence, the man hit the ball. Um, so Chomsky kind of explains kind of what the phrase structure is, which is kind of in this, it is basically, as it is standing right now, a context-free grammar. He explains what a context-free grammar is, why it's kind of useful, it seems useful. There's a recursive structure in language and sentences that you can delegate nouns and verbs to, and like this. Um, he says, uh, like, he, he also mentions that, like, if you do the parse, this is called a parse tree. If you produce the parse tree of a sentence, it technically contains less information than if you gave the sequence of productions of working strings. So we sometimes we've given like like S, we've done it this way, like S goes to uh, NP plus VP, right, something like this. We've given a list of, uh, of things that way. This, he, he says, this contains less information than the sequence of productions themselves because the sequence tells you what order the rules are applied. Well, the tree does not tell you what order you know, like if you if somehow this is in your brain when you're let's like someone says the man hit the ball and somehow this is in your brain in your the way you interpret a sentence, what part do you interpret first? Like, and, uh, it doesn't explain how you understand the sentence necessarily or how you construct the sentence, how you even synthesize the sentence, not just analyze it, but how do you speak it? Like, in what order do things work? So the tree is not sufficient to explain analysis or synthesis, but it is certainly a structure of the sentence. And he says, well, this this. Uh, at, this certainly can explain, uh, produce certain good parts of English, it seems. Uh, but then he notes it's kind of limited. He says, um, let me make sure I get this exact. So he says, uh, we'll just put this in chapter five. Are these the chapters that correspond to the book? Yes. Okay. Each chapter in the, in the book is like a page, though. So it's not really... So 
So limitations of the phrase structure description. He says, um, he notice, notices the following thing. Like S, uh, as the grammar we've defined, is able to correctly produce the string the the man hits the ball which should be ungrammatical the men hit the ball the man hits the ball the man hit the ball when you what is the plural version of this sentence i'm kind of stuck here i'm not that good at english actually what is <laughs> The man hit the ball is correct. The men hits the ball is incorrect. The men hits the ball. The men hits the ball. That's ungrammatical. We can agree that's ungrammatical. Okay, that's the counter example. The men hits the ball. Ungrammatical. We've mixed plural and singular words around. And um, notice that the, the grammar we've given has no ability to distinguish between when you should apply a singular version of the word, the noun or the verb, to when you should apply the plural version of the noun or the word. So he, he mentions that the, this grammar is incapable of distinguishing this. And uh, he says something like, um, make sure I get this right. It, it would be useful to restrict certain rules to only apply in certain contexts. So a context-free grammar is you know, quite literally uh, free of uh, context. So like context-free grammar has no ability to distinguish when you should apply a rule because any rule can be applied at any time. A context, the CFG, in, the CF and CFG literally means context-free. There is no context necessary for you to apply a rule. So that, because that there's, no necess, there's no ability for you to say you can or can't do something here, you can apply the rules anytime, and that allows this to generate ungrammatical sentences when we only want it to produce the grammatical ones. Um, do you guys remember doing Mad Libs as a kid? Yeah. You had like the, and then it'd be like noun, the uh, something, verb, the noun, right? And it was really funny when you put in weird sounding things. The man ran the elephant. I don't know, right? It's, it was really funny when you put in words that didn't sound like they should go together. Uh, this is really, a context-free grammar as its ability to generate English really is nothing except a Mad Libs, right? You have V, P, N, P, uh, you have N and verb. These, are, these have no ability to restrict what nouns and verbs you can pair together. Yes? So a context-free grammar is free of context. So we can make, like, according, according to that tree, we can make ungrammatical sentences. But does that mean it's like, so what, why would we be able to create ungrammatical sentences if it's like a context-free grammar is only supposed to give us like... We want to not, so this specific context-free grammar has no, can, it can, can generate the man hit the ball mm -hmm. and the men hit the ball, mm -hmm. but can also generate the men's, the men hits the ball. So it does generate the plural and the singular version of the sentence, but it has no ability to pair the, the plural and the singular versions of the words together. So it's bad? Yes. Okay. Yes. But it's still a context-free grammar. Yes. Okay. Undeniably context-free, right? Um, but he, a context-free grammar is basically like mad lib. So he, he, he suggests this following mod modification to phrase structure. He says, uh, so basically like a regular grammar uh, has rules like what? We go from non-terminal to uh, terminal and non-terminal, or non-terminal, or epsilon, if necessary. A context-free grammar has rules that go from a single non-terminal to a terminal, a string of terminals and non-terminals. So the context-free grammar is less restrict, is, is more general than the regular grammar. Uh, we call this a context-sensitive grammar. He doesn't use this term yet, but we, he calls this still a generalization of the phrase structure, but we are going to call it today a context-sensitive grammar. A context-sensitive grammar, quite literally, is going to be like a, if A, B are uh, certain strings,
these are like, if these are fixed strings, A and B, then we say like A, B, B uh, produces A, B union sigma star B. So what this means is you can only apply the rule V. You can only, here, you, anytime you see a V in the working string, you can replace it with the rule. Here, you're only allowed to replace uh, perform the replacement if there is some matching conditions on things that have already been produced before and after. You aren't, so this is, uh, make, this makes the phrase structure now sensitive to context. So you can now only apply rules when certain things line up for you to be nice. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the context sensitive grammars, but you should know, uh, just as a fun fact, that they are strictly stronger than uh, the, uh, uh, context-free grammars. There are things that you can do with context-sensitive grammars. There's, they're much more powerful that you cannot do with context-free grammars. So the context-sensitive grammars are really um, important. I mean, they're, they're, they're too strong for us to uh, think about too much. We're still thinking about the context. We're still in the unit of the context-free grammars. But just know that these are, these are powerful, like strictly more powerful. Yes? So intuitively, that's kind of weird because one is free of context. So it's like free of rules. Shouldn't it be like a super Ah, star? so I was, you know, I was thinking, I was hoping someone was going to ask that. The diff what's the difference between like A star, B star, and like A to the N, B to the N, right? Here you only want to, this is, you have no restrictions on the A's and the B's. This is certainly, A to the N, B to the N is a subset of A star, B star. But the subset is defined via this restriction. So this is a harder language to define, but it, and it's actually smaller than this one, technically, if you count the number of elements, infinite, infinite, whatever. But this is a restriction of this one. This one's a subset of this one. However, this one requires a computational task, which a DFA cannot do. So in that sense, that exact computational task makes it difficult. You can do things with, you can do a lot of things, actually, with context-sensitive grammars. It's surprising how many things you can do with context-sensitive grammars. But by restricting, by, like, by having this restriction, you can generate things analogously like between these two. Like you might not be able to restrict certain strings from being produced in a context-free grammar that you can now restrict from being produced in a context-sensitive grammar, then you've defined a more narrow thing that is impossible for context-free grammars to do. Yes? Could you explain how, do you, how you got the, the grammars over there? These? Yes. So this is a regular grammar. We just kind of loosely defined it. This has rules of a single non-terminal on the left to a terminal and non-terminal. So it's going to look like a lowercase and an uppercase or an uppercase or epsilon in case you need it, right? Okay. So this is the, if you have rules that look only look like this, mm -hmm. this restricted form of rules can only generate the regular grammars, excuse me, the regular languages. So we're using, um, we're using sigma as a non-terminal? Sigma is the terminals. Oh, okay. Sigma is the alphabet. So a okay. string is produced over the alphabet, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, Context sensitive, excuse me, context free grammars we defined as a, any string of terminals and non terminals. So this could be like, I don't know, A goes to little a, capital A, little b, capital C, little d, whatever, right? Something complicated, who cares? It's allowed. Um, context sensitive grammars, we, are, we allow the left hand side to have some restrictions on it. Mm -hmm. um, correct. Okay, uh, so this is. He, a phrase structure, he generalizes to allow context sensitivity. Then I don't want to do the example because I'm lazy, but he, he fixes the, the example phrase structure given here. He, allow, he allows it to be sensitive to context, and then he allows it to correctly generate the plural sentences and the singular sentences, but not the mix-up of the both. So that he prevents that from happening. So really to conclude uh, this part, and we're going to cover, this is the first five chapters of syntactic structures. We'll cover the next five in, after the break. But what he says here is like uh, the point, there is no bias here between a speaker and a listener that e equally the grammatical devices we are talking about should be able to distinguish, should both help with synthesis and analysis. You should, it should help you explain how sentences are spoken, and also how they are received as a listener and how you interpret them. So for both of those things. And a grammar is no different than a succinct description of a 
the corpus. A corpus is a set of sentences. So it is no, nothing different than the language. The language itself is the set of correct sentences. The, the grammar is nothing m more complicated than the description of the sentences themselves. And it can explain uh, how the sentences are generated and how to generate new sentences as well. He meant, he kind of likens a, a theory, a scientific theory of grammar here to the kind of scientific theory of chemistry. So like, what is a good scientific theory? You make a sequence of finite observations, you make a model, and then you, your model is a good model if, it's a, if it has an ability to make future predictions, right? You can say something about, not only, it not only explains the observations you've seen so far, but on successive observations, they also satisfy the model. If they don't, then you change the model, right? So he, he kind of likens the, this process to chemistry, where a chemist, the model of chemistry can do what? It enumerates, like how the way atoms connect or whatever, I don't remember, but it like, can enumerate possible chemical compounds. There is probably a way combinatorially using chemistry in the way atoms connect. I don't know it, but you can probably list out all possible molecules, okay? Probably a lot of them. Like, the same way we know the periodic table has all these elements, even if we can't find them, or maybe, we can't, I don't know. Like, maybe I shouldn't speak too much about chemistry. I don't know it. But we, we just made a combinatorial argument to know that there has to exist certain combinations of atoms to, to be on the periodic table, right? Similarly, the grammar serves a similar purpose, where it, um, although it explains sentences, you have a finite amount of observations, and you make a model of English you've listened to so far, you can ex it, it, it does explain the structure of the sentences you have listened to, and it not, but it should be also, it would be a good model for it to explain future sentences that you have not listened to as well. That is how, like, maybe a satisfactory condition of uh, what it means for the model to be good. When we come back after the break, we'll talk about, uh, like, the goals of linguistic theory and, like, the point of, point of doing the science anyway. I don't care about English. I don't care about linguistics. I care, the moral here, just to remind before, we, before I end the video, the moral here is not linguistics itself. It was a scientific approach to an empirical field. You, even today, it's common advice. If you know more math than someone, you're better than them. You go into someone else's house. You have more math with, than them. You can bring a lot of ideas and theory. He brought a foundation. I mean, linguistics was, was an empirical field, okay? People spent, you know, in the field, they would, field workers would go and write down sentences they heard and then try and describe something with that. He doesn't do that here. He comes in top down uh, instead of bottom up or maybe I'm, I'm mixing those up, but he comes in and he's, he tries to explain the way things are just from counterexamples and examples. Like, things he can say and how does that affect his ability to, like, we were able to say this sentence is grammatical, this sentence is ungrammatical. And just using that, we were able to explain something about how the way the grammar should work, right? There was no sampling of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a language that had to be done. We just, you, we were able to explain the model just using uh, our own samples kind of thing. Right. Okay, uh, let's take a break. I'll see you guys in a minute.